Good evening to the Vice Principal Academic, Professor Norman Duncan. Our speaker this evening, Professor Christo Fenter, member of the UP Executive, Deans and Deputy Deans, Professor Wijnand Stein, the head of the Department of Civil Engineering, and our other heads of departments from EBIT, our academic professional staff and colleagues, family of Professor Fenter, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed wonderful to have so many of you attending today's inaugural address. Welcome to this inaugural lecture to be presented by Professor Christo Fenter. The title of his inaugural lecture is Transformative Transport in African Cities, Progress and Prospects for Success. We are indeed privileged to have our Vice Principal Academic, Professor Duncan, with us to officiate at this inaugural lecture. Please join me to welcome Professor Duncan to formally open this event and introduce the speaker for the evening. Members of the University Executive, Council and Senate, Professor Jan Ierloff, Acting Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, Built Environment and Information Technology, Deputy Dean Teaching and Learning, Professor Alta van der Merwe, Acting Deputy Dean, Research and Postgraduate Education, Professor Johan Hubert, other academics of the University of Pretoria, as well as colleagues from other institutions of higher learning. Professor Christoph Fenter, of course, Professor Fenter's family and friends, online audience, esteemed guests. It is my signal pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of Professor Christoph Fenter of the Department of Civil Engineering in the Faculty of Engineering, Built Environment and Information Technology. Colleagues, I remind you that an inaugural lecture represents one of the most important milestones in the careers of academics, as it provides them with the opportunity to inform the university community and academia more generally about the academic journeys. More specifically, it provides an opportunity for the newly appointed or promoted professors to, use, to share with us their research to date, as well as the direction in which they hope to steer their research in future. Above all, for us at the University of Pretoria, an inaugural lecture provides the university with an opportunity to showcase and celebrate the academic achievements of the professor presenting the inaugural lecture. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, Allow me now to introduce Professor Christoph Fenter to you. Professor Christoph Fenter joined the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Pretoria as an associate professor in 2003. In 2019, he was promoted ad hominem to the professoriate. His field of specialization is transportation engineering and planning, a field that focuses on movement that is measured in meters or kilometers instead of in microns or millimeters as in the other fields of civil engineering. Professor Fenter's career started at the University of Stellenbosch, where he obtained his bachelor's and master's degrees in civil engineering. Given his interest in the study of the human interface of transportation, he decided to pursue a doctoral degree in transportation engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. The focus of his PhD studies was transportation planning, with minors in economics and urban planning. He obtained a PhD in civil engineering in 1998. As a graduate research assistant, he spent many hours traveling in taxis to study the impacts of advanced scheduling technologies on paratransit operations. In the process, of course, he discovered what interesting conversations can be had with taxi drivers. After returning to South Africa from the US, Professor Fenter joined the, the division of Transport Technology at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, or the CSIR, where he participated in projects related to travel demand management, public transport planning, technology foresight, and accessible transport for disabled people in South Africa and several other African countries. In pursuit of his aspiration to return to academia, Professor Fenter joined the University of Pretoria in 2003, as, uh, as indicated earlier. Since joining the university, he has taught courses in transportation planning and tra traffic engineering, public transport, transport economics, 
transport modeling, and transport policy. His research interests span all these fields with a specific focus on the socio-technical aspects of public transport provision in cities of the Global South. Much of Professor Fenter's research has been undertaken under the auspices of the Center for Transport Development, a cross-disciplinary research unit at the University of Pretoria, focusing on mobility-related consulting and research. His research has resulted in the publication of, of more than 30 accredited journal articles, 45 peer-reviewed conference papers, seven book chapters, and three position papers commissioned by international think tanks and research organizations on topics related to tra transport planning. Professor Fenter currently serves on the editorial boards of, firstly, the Journal of the, of the South African Institute of Civil Engineers, and secondly, the Journal of Transport and Land Use. Additionally, he has served or is currently serving on the planning boards of several international conferences. Professor Fenter has supervised 30 masters and doctoral students to the successful completion of their studies. He is currently supervising a further two master students and six doctoral students. He also teaches on a master's program at the University of Stellenbosch. Professor Fenter is a registered professional engineer and an NRF rated researcher. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I now invite Professor Fenter to present his inaugural lecture titled Transformative Transport in African Cities, Progress and Prospects for Success. Professor Duncan, Professor Yelov, members of the academic community and other distinguished guests, colleagues, students, friends and family. It is an honor to address you today and I am deeply grateful for this opportunity to share my work and my thoughts with you during this lecture. In my lecture today, I will consider the role that transport and mobility play in transforming African cities into more successful more equitable and sustainable places. There are many challenges along the way and transport has been hit hard by the COVID pandemic, but there are also massive opportunities for using transport to help shape uh, the cities of the future. My lecture will consist of two main parts. First, I will focus on the global challenges of mobility and various attempts over the last 20 years to address these challenges, specifically within Sub-Saharan Africa. In the second part of the lecture, I will offer a few reflections on how these changes have intersected with my personal journey and my views on the discipline of transportation planning and what I believe is worth doing in the future. I will start by acknowledging the many people who have been part of my journey up to now. They include friends, mentors, professors during my studies at Stellenbosch and in Berkeley. Three professors who in particular influenced and encouraged me are professors Fred Hugo and uh, Christo Bester from Stellenbosch, who set me on my path of academic studies in transportation, and Prof Vukan Vucic, who sparked my interest in public transport and led me to go to Berkeley. I also want to acknowledge colleagues at the CSIR and in our Department of Civil Engineering at Tux. And of course, the students who are the real reason that we are here who inspire us and who we have all been missing so much during the last year and a half. Finally, my family. My ouders, Magda and Herman, wat nie meer met ons is nie, hulle het aan my lewe gegee en soveel geleentede. My sisters and my brothers-in-law, my kinders, Rauhan en Arjun, julle is die vreugde van my hart, and my wife, Nandini, partner in dance, in prayer, in parenting, in getting up to mountaintops, and a source of wisdom and balance in my life. Thank you. Why are we here? Well, people come to cities for access, access to jobs, to education, to cultural and consumer experiences, access to each other. And being able to move around is a prerequisite for most kinds of access, so mobility is key to the functioning of cities and regions. 
It is the job of transportation engineers to facilitate this access in a safe and an efficient manner for people and for goods through the provision of movement infrastructure, networks and systems. If we look at the role of transport in cities today, we know that mobility has severe implications for three things that we care very much about. Sustainability, equity and efficiency. Sustainability because mobility is resource, resource intensive and is a major contributor to greenhouse gases and environmental problems. Thus, transport is at the heart of achieving several of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Efficiency, because societies spend between 10 and 20% of their wealth on transport, on getting around. And the costs rise exponentially when congestion becomes widespread. So getting cities to work better means getting them to move better. Equity, because the ability to access opportunities and to move around is not spread equally across the population, but varies according to whether you own a car, where you live, and what your transport conditions are like. And these outcomes are not inevitable, but the result of the deliberate decisions and actions that planners and engineers make. So complex as the factors of mobility are, in the global south, the challenges of mobility are exacerbated by the collision of two trends. So firstly, urbanization. Urban areas are expected to triple in size between 2000 and 2030. And the greatest growth is expected in Africa, where we will have to see major investments in infrastructure, which create opportunities for doing things differently and better. Secondly, growing wealth is accompanied by increased motorization or the use of private vehicles. In the global south, there are two and a half to three times more vehicles being registered than new babies born every year. Within Africa, we do not yet know exactly what this trajectory of private vehicle growth will look like or where it will end, but the evidence suggests that cities will get significantly more crowded and congested. In Sub-Saharan Africa, this collision is framed by a few contextual challenges that uh, both drive the key problems and shape the opportunities around what we can do about them. So firstly, Sub-Saharan African cities tend to have land use patterns that are not optimal for public transport. Cities have small, dense cores surrounded by large hinterlands of low density sprawl, both because of informal housing and suburban development. And this creates long travel distances, which are difficult to serve with public transport. Over the last few decades, African governments have neglected urban transport in general and public transport in particular. The older legacy bus and rail systems have declined, leading to an undersupply of transport. In South Africa, of course, governance problems with COVID have all but decimated our urban rail system. At the same time, what transport investment there has been in Sub-Saharan Africa has tended to be biased towards cars and highways rather than public transport or pedestrians. And this skews the benefits towards higher income groups and entrenches an inability to access opportunities. So into the mobility gap has stepped the informal transport sector. Minibuses, motorcycle taxis, three-wheelers, boda bodas, so forth. They are the majority of transport providers throughout Sub-Saharan Africa and while uh, they have benefited otherwise stranded people, they also have brought problems of suboptimal and disconnected services that come at a high cost. And lastly, poverty. Of the world's 28 poorest countries, 27 are in sub-Saharan Africa. Poverty puts, tre puts tremendous pressure on public transport, leading to either substandard services or the need for subsidies, which many, many governments are not willing to provide. The issue of what standard of mobility can we afford to provide remains a significant one, which I will say about more later. The end result of these realities is that mobility in sub-Saharan African cities is generally quite problematic. Nevertheless, there are some changes afoot that hold promise to start bending the curve towards more inclusive and well-functioning cities. The efforts in the public transport arena can be grouped into three areas. Firstly, investment in new public transport services, governance and regulatory reform, 
and technological innovation largely driven by the public sector. These efforts are all nascent and will no doubt evolve and spawn new developments in coming years. Academic scholarship has started to examine them in terms of what they say about our understanding of the mobility problem and their impacts and successes and failures. I will describe these, e these efforts with reference to a study that I recently completed together with co-authors Ian Barrett, Mark Zeitgeist and Norma Chiore on behalf of the Volvo Research and Educational Foundations. It was a position paper looking at the state of knowledge on formal public transport systems in Sub-Saharan Africa to identify trends and problems and to set a research agenda. This provided a culmination of a lot of my work in this field over the last few years. We identified new public transport projects that have become operational in 16 cities with several more in various stages of planning. And these include five new rail systems, including the Gau train on our doorstep, and also uh, upgraded uh, commuter services and light rail projects in cities like Addis Ababa and Abuja. Also six implemented bus rapid transit services, four of which are in South Africa, plus Lagos and Dar es Salaam, and other bus renewal projects in cities like George and Kigali. In addition, BRT was planned, but either not implemented or failed or stalled in several other cities, including some smaller South African cities, as well as Accra and Kampala and Nairobi. Now looking at these investment trends, it is clear that bus rapid transit, or BRT, has become the preferred mechanism through which many governments and development agencies in Africa want to improve passenger transport. And it is mainly on BRT that I will focus here. So bus rapid transit uses dedicated bus lanes, specially constructed stations and high frequencies to provide an attractive, fast and a high quality service to passengers at a lower cost, a lower investment cost than rail. The slogan is think trains use buses. So BRT has rejuvenated the image of bus systems worldwide and is so popular that it is now found in almost 200 cities internationally. This preference for BRT has both positive and negative consequences. On the positive side, the concept has gripped the imaginations of politicians as an affordable modernization option supported by robust technology. However, there's also been a growing criticism of BRT as an imported solution that is insufficiently sensitive to African realities and too easily captured by special interests. This reflects a growing appreciation of the political dimension of public transport interventions and the emergence of critical scholarship around the decision-making processes behind these projects. So one might ask, what have these BRT systems achieved? There have been a growing number of studies measuring the impacts of BRT systems on passengers. We at UP undertook one of the first in South Africa in 2011 just two years after the first system in, Re in Johannesburg opened, to measure the benefits of that first route on Soweto residents. We asked the question whether BRT was making some contribution towards poverty reduction. Now, these were early days, but our survey showed that BRT saved passengers on average 13 minutes of travel time per trip due to its fast service and its short waiting times. So those are real benefits. Regarding travel costs, the evidence was more mixed as BRT is priced at a similar level to the minibus taxi and some passengers end up paying more depending on their trip distances. We revisited the question of benefits in 2017 and this time searching for ways in which the BRT enhanced the ability of Soweto users to reach job opportunities. Now the blue and the green areas on the map show uh, show areas that can be accessed from Soweto within a reasonable time and cost budget, taking the BRT fare into account. With a master's student, Nahungu Leonjanga, we found that indeed the area of affordable access expanded, as you can see on the map, as the BRT became operational, thus putting more jobs within the reach of low-income earners. 
And similar findings from Cape Town and Dar es Salaam have confirmed that BRT does in fact deliver benefits to many of its users. But this is not spread evenly across the community. There is evidence that middle income people make much more use of BRT than either low income or high income people. Richer folks in Soweto use cars. Poorer passengers find BRT too expensive or not close enough to where they live to be of daily use. And this skews the benefits of BRT investment away from those who may already face social exclusion. So overall, our review of the literature on BRT deployment showed that it is becoming clear that implementing BRT systems in Sub-Saharan Africa is not the quick, obviously successful solution that it is often held up to be, and that in fact it is problematic in terms of delays in the expansion, expansion of starter BRT routes in some cities, the failure of PR, uh, pilot BRT schemes in other cities like Nelson Mandela Bay and Accra, long implementation periods, sometimes there are decades between project conceptualization and opening of the first route, and the higher cost and lower than expected financial performance of these systems. BRT projects are clearly more complex than commonly thought in terms of the demands that they put on institutions, on finance, and the need to involve existing industries. In fact, from the early euphoria of launching the first BRT in 2009, BRT has, become, has come under increasing criticism from politicians and the media, citing exactly these concerns of slow deployment, cost overruns, poor passenger numbers, and the higher than expected subsidy bills that government has to pick up. Was this criticism justified? I was curious about the numbers and undertook a benchmarking exercise against international systems in 2019. Now, this figure shows one important metric of bus system performance, the number of passenger boardings per bus kilometer supplied. A higher number is good because it indicates that your service is attractive to passengers, that your buses are not running empty or traveling long distances without passenger turnover. Against international practice, the three South African systems uh, in Chwane, Joburg, and Cape Town fare pretty poorly, as you can see here, even when we apply statistical models to control for factors such as the size of the network and population densities. This means that our BRTs have comparatively low revenues, recovering between 10 and 45 percent of operating costs from passenger fares, and this requires then considerable government subsidies. When searching for the reasons for this, we found that we can't blame it on inefficient bus operations, but rather our unique land use conditions, especially the long distances in South African cities, and continued competition from the minibus taxis, which uh, the BRT were, BRTs were supposed to uh, displace, that are largely outside of the BRT's direct control. Now, given these conditions, BRT in South Africa will never pay for itself, but I don't believe that that should actually be a criterion for investment in public transport, because if we want well-functioning, attractive cities, then we have to pay for them. Nevertheless, the question is, given our specific realities, have we been building systems that are too expensive, locking us into this situation of slow rollout and perpetual political resistance? It turns out that this question has been gripping transport planners throughout Africa and led to some interesting developments. The question is really, what are affordable standards for BRT that would find the balance between effective, uh, effectiveness and affordability uh, given our unique conditions? And our review of recent projects in uh, the subcontinent identified two design approaches with very different characteristics, so-called full BRT and BRT light. A full BRT has been implemented in South African cities and also Dar es Salaam. And the exemplar for BRT light is Lagos in Nigeria, but similar systems have also been planned for Nairobi and Kampala, although their rollout is now stalled. 
So what are the differences? A full BRT is modeled on successful systems in South, of, South America that move very high volumes of people. Now, to do this in a crowded road environment, it relies on as much separation of the BRT system from the surrounding road operations as possible. Now, this means fully dedicated bus lanes on trunk routes, usually running in the median or the middle of the roadway. While BRT light depends on some combination of lighter infrastructure and simpler technologies. This means some priority bus lanes, but also some stretches where buses operate in mixed traffic. Full BRT uses enclosed stations where passengers pay their fares when they enter the station so that they can board fast when the bus arrives. While BRT light uses open stations that are more like enhanced bus stops, typically low floor, and where passengers often pay when they board the bus. Stations are also often bilateral or on the regular or outside side of the bus instead of the median, so that passengers board on the usual side of the bus. In terms of vehicles, full BRT usually requires specially designed buses with doors on the wrong side to enable them to make use of the median stations, which are also often high floor. BRT Lite is able to accommodate standard buses without level boarding. In general then, full BRT depends on heavier, more dedicated infrastructure and technology, while BRT Lite uses lighter infrastructure and existing systems and features. The full BRT approach has been advocated by several international advocacy groups and consultants who have really held out the full Monty as the ultimate that every city should aspire to. There has been a growing critical examination of the role of such players, with some scholars who have looked at issues of policy adoption and circulation, arguing that these are unnecessarily restrictive given the diversity of needs of road and traffic conditions and of local industries and government capacity that you find in the different countries. In our own interviews with decision makers in the public transport industry in South Africa, we found strong agreement that the one-size-fits-all approach of full BRT is not suitable and that much more affordable standards are needed to make BRT sustainable in South Africa. So when thinking about what such affordable standards might entail, the key trade-off is, of course, implementation cost against performance such as capacity and speed. And as I have said, financial sustainability and the long-term ability of cities to afford the public transport systems that they build is a key dilemma in all African cities. Our analysis indicated that BRT Lite can come at an initial cost that is between two and six times lower than that of full BRT, while operating costs may or may not be lower. Now, this cost differential can make a big difference to affordability. For instance, initial planning in Nairobi found that only BRT light was economically viable, offering a benefit cost ratio of 1.8, as opposed to a mere 0.2 for the alternative full BRT design. This also means that BRT light may be more popular with decision makers in the long run and that network expansions are more likely to be funded quickly. But BRT light also has speeds that may be up to 30% lower and can carry fewer people per hour than full BRT, so the benefits are lower. I argue, however, that the reduction in capacity that we incur in exchange for lower specification might be acceptable, at least as a transitional strategy given that we generally don't need such huge capacities in South African cities, especially where rail, once it returns, already is supposed to serve the highest demand corridors. And speed, it's less important to passengers than we might suppose. In mode choice modeling work that I've been doing with PhD student Gary Hayes in Gauteng, we found that passengers generally have a rather low value of time which means that travel speed only accounts for less than about 10% of their reasons for choosing BRT over another mode like the taxi. Now this means that heavy speed enhancing infrastructure like bus lanes and enclosed stations, they raise costs without raising revenues because um, passengers are not willing to pay for those speed increases 
and this increases the subsidy requirements to levels where they are no longer politically palatable. We do not yet know what the long-term implications of choosing different cost performance trade-offs might be, especially on the BRT's ability to attract car users. But it certainly makes sense to consider a more flexible design approach to road-based public transport. So what might such flexibility look like in South Africa? Firstly, I think it is more helpful to acknowledge that the binary between full and light BRT is actually false, as these are actually only extreme points on a continuum of te technological possibilities. For instance, priority for public transport vehicles can be provided through a variety of means, ranging from full-length dedicated lanes to short bypass lanes on congested sections um, and at intersections to traffic signal priority just for buses. Stop and station design can vary according to a range of exclusiveness. Vehicle types can vary between new high-capacity articulated buses through to more standard specifications. This continuum is, is, however, made up not only of what bus lanes and stations and vehicles look like, but there, are also, there is also a range of different service types from the conventional trunk and feeder to direct services that don't require passengers to transfer. Fare technologies can vary between high-tech smart cards, which are great if you have the administrative and the financial resources to manage it, through to more pa basic paper-based tickets. And BRT can either be operated in isolation from the rest of the public transport regime as a standalone system, or with higher levels of intentional integration with existing bus, minibus, taxi, or even bicycle and walking services. So generally, these six basic elements range from more extensive and more expensive through to the lighter touch and less expensive uh, systems on the right. My argument is that the right combination of these six elements will vary between different cities depending on their affordability thresholds, their existing transport environment, and importantly, the goals for their public transport system. A city that has the goal to provide really competitive services that will attract car users and become the backbone mobility system in the region will typically opt for the full BRT package, which includes most of the elements on the left. However, a city that wants a more modest role for BRT, that aims to empower and improve informal taxi services in parallel, will want to choose elements that maximize integration and compatibility with existing services. And that might include lighter bus priority measures and stations. And uh, the system might even combine different levels of infrastructure and service types within the same system in a non-dogmatic way or a smaller city without congestion problems, but who wants to improve accessibility and service quality, might focus on route structure and integration and not technology or infrastructure at all. What will this deliver? A more appropriate mix of design elements that suits the specific objectives of a city at a cost that is sustainable given the size of the demand. There are already some examples available that show that authorities are considering a shift towards more flexible BRT approaches. So-called complementary bus routes operate in mixed traffic on lower density parts of their routes and only join dedicated bus lanes where congestion is really an issue. We see this in our own backyard with the new Arayeng BRT route that has been extended from Loftus station where the bus lane ends to run in mixed traffic all the way out to Menland Mall. The cities of Cape Town and Joburg are currently considering to run substantial parts of the next phases of their BRT networks in mixed traffic and to use low platform open designs instead of the current enclosed stations. An option that we haven't yet seen is so-called hybrid infrastructure operations. It has already been suggested in the media that taxis should be able to use the bus lanes which appear to be underutilized. Now, I, I examined this option with master student uh, Simeon de Prier through micro simulation of a BRT corridor here in Chuane, and we showed that moving taxis over to a bus lane could lead to a 50% reduction in travel time for taxi passengers 
and improve traffic flow for car users in the general lanes without causing extra delay for the buses. Importantly, this is under the current conditions where the bus frequencies are quite low. I think there is merit in looking at providing not just bus lanes, but multi-purpose public transport priority lanes on strategic corridors that could be used by all public transport vehicles, including minibus taxis. There are good precedents for these kinds of facilities if they are well-designed in other countries and even in South Africa. A third example of more flexible approaches towards public transport upgrading is to target the minibus taxi system directly by providing priority infrastructure just for their vehicles. Now this works on the principle that there is a sweet spot on lighter demand corridors where taxi frequencies are medium to high, but where full bus lanes are not yet warranted. And there we can use localized interventions such as short queue bypass lanes at intersections to provide real benefits without having to attempt the much harder and risky task of trying to restructure the whole network or to formalize the taxis. Modeling work we did with a PhD student, Lorenz de Beer, showed that this could have a net positive welfare effect and deliver travel time savings to passengers and a cost saving to taxi operators by reducing their fuel costs and improving their vehicle productivity of between 1,000 and 9,000 rands per month per taxi. I want to briefly touch on governance and regulatory reform in the urban transport sector. Now, governance is clearly a key constraint to the effective deployment of better public transport. Typical reasons include institutional fragmentation, lack of policy that is supportive of public transport, and lack of appropriate regulatory mechanisms. BRT projects are often seen as a mechanism for achieving institutional reform by establishing pockets of excellence that can develop over time into full metropolitan-wide transport authorities. And indeed, we have seen some movements in this direction take place in uh, cities like Lagos, uh, in Cape Town, Kampala, and in Gauteng more recently. It is clear by now that a key issue for upgrading projects in formal public transport is its relationship to informal or minibus taxi operators. This is an incredibly complex and contentious issue that could cause the delay or the demise of new public transport, as we have seen already in cities like Nelson Mandela Bay. I won't go into this in detail, but we clearly need better ways of empowering the informal sector and integrating them in a sensible network. We need to devise better processes and pathways without allowing vested interests from capturing the project to the detriment of passengers in the long run. The last point I want to address, technology. The rhetoric of rapid transit often foresees great technological progress during the implementation of new systems, but the reality has been that the actual adoption of technology has often been quite problematic. Smart cards or electronic fare collection is one example. Some BRT and rail systems in sub-Saharan Africa have failed to implement them properly. And in at least one South African city, the initial automated ticketing system of the BRT had to be entirely replaced soon after implementation because it was found to be not fit for purpose. Of course, this came at, at a huge cost. There are issues of common standards to allow cards to be integrated across systems. And most operators also fail to be able to make effective use of the vast amounts of passenger trip data that are generated by these systems. On the positive side, there is a fair amount of innovation happening in the private sector in the use of smartphones to collect better data on minibus taxi routes and to collect fares through cashless tickets, ticketing. And we are likely to see some interesting technological developments here in sub-Saharan Africa. So to recap, public transport upgrading is complex, contentious undertaking that requires more than just te technical knowledge to pull off successfully. 
It's possible to harvest significant benefits with BRT systems, but these are not necessarily transformative in the sense of reaching pro-poor objectives. And thirdly, we have a diversity of spatial demand and economic conditions in our cities. And in order to respond to this diversity, public transport planners must consider a wider, a more flexible range of interventions that could involve lighter touch infrastructure and regulatory approaches. I now want to move on to offering some reflections on the transportation planning discipline in general. Firstly, what is transportation planning? It encompasses the planning of transportation systems at a variety of timescales, varying from the strategic, uh, involving timeframes of 20 to 50 years, to more short-term timeframes involving the optimization, the management, and the operation of transport services and facilities. Since its inception in the 1950s as a scientific discipline that was primarily geared towards planning for roads, and it was discovered that roads by themselves do not solve all mobility problems, transportation planning has grown to embrace a much more multimodal approach with a much wider set of goals than simply solving congestion. So today the transportation planner has to function in the nexus between infrastructure, land use, and spatial processes, and people's behavior and social processes, and they need to understand these. The field has embraced more complexity, more open-endedness, and requires the professional to work in cross-disciplinary contexts with land use planners, with IT specialists, communities of users, and so on. This requires the planner to have a variety of tools in their toolbox, including quantitative statistical, engineering, economics, and qualitative en engagement skills. They also need a variety of theoretical perspectives, including conventional physics and its derived traffic flow theory, through to more behaviorally oriented theory, including behavioral economics, disaggregate choice theory, and psychology. Our training approaches do not yet fully reflect this depth, and I think finding the right balance remains a challenge for the education of transportation professionals of the future. I have found this interface with human behavior a particularly rewarding aspect of transportation engineering throughout my own career. From my PhD work, where I focused on the travel behavior of disabled and elderly passengers, I have continued to be fascinated by the question of how our decisions around what, where, and how transport services are provided affect people, and particularly those who are excluded, be they women, rural communities, or low-income people. I've always loved public transport for the efficiency and the equity and the human scale quality that it can bring to a city, and because it can force us to come out of our boxes and into contact with other people that we share our city with. So here I can hear my family groan, who have been dragged onto every metro, train, bus, and rickshaw, wherever in the world we have found ourselves, and sometimes even forced to pose for a photograph. In the area of public transport, a particular highlight has been my involvement with the BRT Center of Excellence, a research collaboration funded by the Volvo Research and Educational Foundations over the last five years. We collaborated with three other universities, including MIT, the Catholic University of Chile, and the University of Sydney, as well as the World Resources Institute, on research around the deployment of BRT and bus-based systems in various contexts. And much of the work on minibus bus taxis and BRT that I presented in this lecture was funded and done under this program. I want to conclude with some thoughts on knowledge gaps and some of the themes which I believe transportation planning scholarship should be picking up in the future. I believe that needed future directions for both research and teaching in transportation lie at the interface of these three key issues. 
better integration and embedding of mobility systems within the local context, better understanding of behavioral responses, and leveraging the rapidly developing technological landscape to mitigate the negative impacts and to enhance the benefits of mobility to society. It is often the unexpected responses of commuters or of taxi drivers or of regulators or land use developers that take the mickey out of our best made plans. We need to understand these behaviors. These behaviors are changing and adapting to advances in technology in as yet unforeseen ways. So we need to not only anticipate those changes, but um, also design accordingly and understand how to influence people's behavior towards achieving desirable objectives. So across these three dimensions lie key perspectives that we should be exploring in research. We need a better understanding of transport systems in their techno-social context. Now, this includes how they interface with politics, with values, with aspirations, and with economic processes. Transport planning tends to be overly focused on end states and not enough on processes of change, on pathways to get from where we are to where we want to be. How do we leverage what we have? For instance, we have a vibrant informal public transport economy to meet our future aspirations. Thirdly, we preach the importance of multidisciplinary approaches, but I must admit that as an engineer, I have found it frustratingly difficult to cross barriers dividing me from my colleagues in other planning or social science disciplines. We still don't speak the same language and we need more practical ways to cross these aisles and to teach our students how to do so. Related to this, we too often fail at speaking to our colleagues in practice. There's often a big divide between what we think needs to be done and what is actually happening in planning departments, in design offices, and in legislative chambers. This is challenging given restricted resources all around, but it is needed to be effective at making transport truly transformative. I thank you. Thank you, Professor Fenter, for a very informative lecture on transformative transport in African cities. The research focus of Professor Fenter aligns very well with the research focus areas of our EBIT faculty, and specifically with that of smart cities and transportation. Furthermore, there is also a strong alignment with the sustainable development goals of the United Nations with specific reference to SDG 11, where the focus is to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. African cities, especially those in Sub-Saharan Africa, creates many challenges, such as complex land use patterns for optimized transport systems, but also offer opportunities for creating more vibrant and inclusive places. As indicated by Professor Fenter in his lecture, many African cities are in the process of upgrading transportation infrastructure with various degrees of success due to the complexity of transportation systems. Many of us who attended tonight's lecture benefit from the insights presented with regard to the bus rapid transit systems, so-called BRTs. It is in this context that I do appreciate the research conducted to create flexible design approaches that can result in making the BRT system accessible to the poor. Responding to the diversity of spatial demand and economic conditions in our cities requires public transport planners to consider a wider, more flexible range of interventions that could involve innovative infrastructure, but also regulatory approaches. It was clearly highlighted that we not only need technological innovation, but also good governance and regulatory frameworks. 
For the transportation planning profession in general, future directions for growth lie in engaging better with human behavior and change processes and engaging in transdisciplinary research. I'm also of the opinion that advances made in data science and big data should be leveraged in any endeavor to transform the transportation industry in African cities. As mentioned by Professor Fenter, the importance of transforming the transportation industry in sub-Saharan Africa is of vital importance for not only economic development, but also for human well-being in the large. It is in this context that a contribution made by transportation engineers is of immense importance. I am of the opinion that Professor Fenter in tonight's lecture clearly demonstrated the technical insight to do so, but also showed his passion for transforming transport on the African continent. I would like to thank Professor Duncan for participating in tonight's inaugural address, given his many commitments and obligations. Special appreciation goes to the EBIT team under the leadership of our faculty manager and our marketing colleagues. Lastly, we would like to thank Louis Clute Productions for tonight's live broadcast and also for the technical support for the evening. Please be on the lookout for other expert lecture series forthcoming by our esteemed professors of the University of Pretoria and in particular from the Faculty of Engineering, both Environment and Information Technology. Thank you all for attending this virtual inaugural lecture and of course, very importantly, vaccinate, stay healthy, keep safe, and I hope you all have a good evening. Good night. Oh.